All right. So, let me tell you first of all that chapter 12 is a standalone chapter. It's not going to be combined. And although what's in chapter 12 is almost all brand new material to you, I don't think any Chem 1 teacher really covers much of kinetics. So even though it's all new material, chapter 12 is a very easy chapter. Okay? The chapter 12 test scores are very often some of the highest of the whole year. Okay? So, for whatever reason, people that are math inclined, not math inclined, all types of people tend to do well in this chapter. So, what is kinetics all about? Well, up to this point, folks, we have never talked about how fast reactions occur. We've had in some previous chapters, I've asked you to predict whether a reaction was spontaneous or not, but we've never talked about how fast they are. And that's what this chapter deals with. Rates, speeds of reaction. And just because something is spontaneous doesn't necessarily mean that it happens quickly. Okay? Something that's spontaneous, a reaction could occur in one second, or a spontaneous reaction could take 50,000 years to occur. Okay? Spontaneity does not mean fast. Sometimes it does, but not always. Now, before I pull anything up on this slide, I want to say that I am not a calculus teacher, nor am I a pre-calculus teacher. I am not teaching the topics in Chapter 12 from a calculus perspective. However, those of you that are in calculus or have taken calculus, you will see some connections. I'm not going to make those connections, but you will probably see them because this is not a calculus-based course. Okay, but there are some connections. So, anytime you're measuring a rate, like if you're measuring the rate that a car is traveling, you would measure that rate as a change in position or a distance per some unit of time. Well, in chemistry, we're not dealing with distances, so rates in chemistry are measured in changes in concentration. Okay. What do brackets mean in chemistry? Molarity. Molarity. Delta means change. So we're talking about how does a change, how does a reactant, a product, how does its concentration change over time? Okay. And... This is an equation we have seen before. See if you remember. This very synthesis reaction, this very same one, has a name. Do you remember it had that World War II the Nazi Haber Germany? Process. The Haber process. That's right. Haber process. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Haber. Okay, if this is the reaction we're using as an example, it should make sense to you that as time goes by, the concentration of my hydrogen, because it is a reactant, will be decreasing over time. I'm using it more and more of it up to make product. Nitrogen is my other reactant. It is also going to decrease in concentration over time. But let me ask you this question. I want you to look at this reaction at how it's balanced and all that. Why would hydrogen <clears throat> decrease, go away, however you want to say it? Why would hydrogen disappear faster the than nitrogen? Yeah, the mole ratio. Every time we use up one mole of nitrogen, we're going to use up three moles of hydrogen. It's th disappearing three times faster than the nitrogen. So if both the reactants are disappearing, what should be happening to the product? Increase. Yeah. Product should increase. 
And I would never ask you this on a test question, but if you really want to get technical, you could say that ammonia, the product, is appearing twice as fast as nitrogen is disappearing. Okay. I wouldn't ask you that on a test. I just wanted to say that. What's happening when all these curves level out? We're reaching equilibrium. And remember, equilibrium does not mean concentrations are all equal. It just means their rates are equal. Now, there's different ways that you can calculate rates. Okay? Um, if you were asked an average rate, you could say, you know, over the course of 10 minutes, how does the concentration of this reactant change? That would be over a long interval of time. We are going to be interested in this class in what's called an instantaneous rate. This is kind of an algebraic way to find an instantaneous rate. You know, if, these, if that's a reactant disappearing, and I want to know what is the speed of disappearance right at that moment, draws line, tangent to the curve, you do this whole trigonometry business, we're not doing it that way. Okay? This is a way to do it, we are going to do it a different way. So, first thing that you will be asked to do, and I'm going to show you today a very simple example, you will be asked to write out what is called a rate law. And here's the thing. Okay, all reactions are reversible. When you start a reaction, you've got reactants only, making product, making product, making product, making product. Eventually, the products start turning back into reactants. The rates become equal. You're at equilibrium. Okay, we are going to be concerned with that instantaneous rate, not just at any point. We are, in chemistry, going to be interested in what is the rate of the reaction at the moment that it begins? That split second that the reaction starts. Now let me ask you this question. The moment that a reaction starts, you put, let's say there's two reactants. You put those two reactants together. Are there any products? No, not yet. At the very second that that reaction begins, you have reactants only. You haven't made any product yet. So our rates, because we're going to be concerned with what is it at the very beginning, we are only going to care about reactants, not products. We will take measurements as soon as the reactants are mixed. Initial rate method just means we want to find the speed right at the beginning of that reaction. And I want to show you what a rate law looks like. For this reaction, this is what a rate law looks like. Okay. This is why this chapter tends to be so, so easy for people. If you are asked to write a rate law, this is not an equation. Okay, We're not plugging things in. I mean, you could, but you don't need to. Okay. If you're asked to write a rate law, you are literally going to write on your paper, rate equals lowercase k, which is called a rate constant. Make sure you write it as lowercase. Anybody remember what an uppercase k means? Equilibrium. The equilibrium constant. Constant. Okay. Constant. Some of you are probably going to say yeah. Kelvin. Okay. As a variable, I mean, capital K is an equilibrium <coughs> constant. Lowercase k is a rate constant. What do brackets mean again? Molarity. How come there's only the reactant? I mean, what about these guys? We don't care about products. We don't care about products. There are no products at the very beginning of a reaction. Okay? And the only thing that you're actually going to be solving for is what's called a rate order. It's what is the value of that exponent. Okay? So I'm going to show you how to do that. It's really easy. 
two things to keep in mind here. We've pretty much already said it. There's a lot of words here. All this means is rate laws are only going to contain reactants, not products, because we're at the very beginning of the reaction. And the only way to find that exponent in a rate law is to get experimental data. Meaning, if I'm giving you a problem where I say write the rate law, I have to give you a table of data. And I'm going to show you one in just a second. Okay. Um, there are two types of rate laws. This is the first type that we're going to look at at the beginning of the chapter. This one we won't get to until the end of the chapter. If you ever see a question that just says write the rate law, they mean this first kind. Okay. Some of you calculus people might start to see a little connection. This whole differential integrated. There's some calculus terms here. Okay. But we're going to focus on this first type. All right. We already talked about that. This is what a rate law problem looks like. Okay. I've got a reaction right up here given a table of experimental data okay, for the reactants. Remember, the reactants are the only ones we care about. I've got some molarities listed, and the last column has rates, speeds of reaction. And the question says, determine the rate law. Okay, fine. Literally, I'm going to write rate equals lowercase k put my first reactant, I'm going to multiply it times the other reactant. If there were a third reactant, I'd multiply it times the third one. And we're going to use this table of data to find what are the exponents that need to be placed next to each reactant. <coughs> so, Tell me this. I want you to look up in this chart. We'll start with the ammonium. Tell me which two, which two out of this, these three experiments should we compare where ammonium's concentration changes but nitrite remains constant? Okay, two and three. Sounds good. Well, Look at these two numbers. Going from experiment two to three, here's the molarity is changing. What is it being multiplied by? Two. two. Okay. Nitrite is remaining constant. It has to. What is happening to the rate? Some of you may be able to just see it. It doubles. It's also being doubled. Okay. Doubling the concentration doubled the rate. 2 to what power equals 2? One. 1. So guess what? The exponent for ammonium is 1, which you could either write in or not. If it's an exponent of 1, you actually don't have to write it. Alright. And I'm sure you're going to have lots of questions. Don't worry, I am going to answer all of them. Let's do the same thing for nitrite. What two experiments should I compare where nitrite changes, but ammonium remains constant? One and two. Okay, one and two. Ammonium stays constant. It has to. What's happening here? It's being multiplied by two. What about the speed, the rate? Also being multiplied by two. <coughs> 2 to what power equals 2? 1. 1. This one also has an exponent of 1. Let me give you some other hypothetical situations because I'm sure you're all wondering. Okay, first of all, let me say that these exponents in these kinds of problems will always be whole numbers. 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay. What if and I realize this is not what the numbers show, but just go with me on this. 
what if this, this remains constant, this one is doubled, and this one was multiplied by 4? What would the exponent be? 2. It would be an exponent of 2. What if this is doubled and this is multiplied by 8? 2, 4, 3, 3. The exponent would be a 3. <laughs> What if I had this situation? This is doubled, and this one remains constant. What's the exponent? Zero. Okay. Let me give you another situation. What if this one was multiplied by three, and this was multiplied by 9. That's an exponent of 2. It doesn't always have to be in 2's. Um, you'll never see a situation like this. It's not that they don't exist, but you will not be given situations like this. This one is multiplied by 3. This one is multiplied by 11. Does that exponent come out to a whole number? No. It's not that these situations don't exist, but you will not have to solve for them. Okay? You are going to see exponents of 0, 1, 2, 3. Honestly, I have never seen a problem like this where the exponent was a 4 or anything higher. Okay? So there's your answer right there. That is a rate law. There has to be a catch. It's too easy. No, there is no catch. Yes, David. Um, it will, and we're going to do an example of that. Not today, but... Okay. Um, here's another rate law. Okay, this one has three reactants. Okay, you might have very easy multiple choice questions. Like, I give you this rate law, and I say, what is the rate order for the hydrogen ion. All I'm asking you is, what is the exponent for the hydrogen ion? You would say, hydrogen ion is second order. Okay, that iodide ion is third order. This one, I don't even know the name of it, this one is first order. Order. If you are ever asked what is the overall reaction order of the whole thing, you just add up the exponents. 1 plus 2 plus 3. This is a sixth order reaction. Isn't that easy? It's so easy. 